In this video, we want to introduce the idea of basis. And we're doing this now because basis is closely related to the idea of a subspace. So we've been talking about a subspace as a vector set that is both closed under scalar multiplication and closed under addition. In other words, I have one or more vectors. Those vectors are forming a set. I have a set of vectors. And within that set, the vectors that make up that set, when I look at the set as a whole, it's closed under scalar multiplication and it's closed under addition. Now we want to say that every subspace needs a basis, or we want to be able to come up with a basis for every subspace. And a basis has two conditions. First, the basis has to span the subspace. And second, the vectors that form the basis have to be linearly independent. In other words, think about the basis of a subspace as sort of the foundation of the subspace or the definition of a subspace. I need a vector set that I can use for every subspace that will fundamentally define it or define it at its core. So if you remember from before, one of the things we said is that R2, R2 space, is actually a subspace itself of R2, and R3 itself is a subspace of R3. For that matter, Rn is a subspace of Rn. And we said, let's just take R2 as an example. So two-dimensional space, the xy coordinate plane. We said that in order to define R2, we needed exactly two vectors. We needed those vectors to be linearly independent, and we needed those vectors to be actually in R2. In other words, if we have two linearly independent vectors that are defined in R2, we can use those to define all of R2. These two vectors will span all of R2. So the point we're making here is that we can use just two vectors to sort of form a foundation to form a basis for all of R2 or to span all of R2. Another way we could say this is that if we have three vectors, for example, that are defined in R2, we have more vectors than we need to span R2. We can do it, we can span R2 with two linearly independent vectors. We don't need more than that. So we could use two vectors to form the basis of R2, but three vectors would never form the basis for R2 because it's more than we need. So a basis will never include more than what you actually need to span a space or span a subspace. If you're given a vector set that has more than you need, then in order to get the basis out of that vector set, we want to simplify it down to just what we need to span the space. So for instance, if I'm given a vector set V, and let's say that this vector set includes three vectors that are in two-dimensional space, that are defined in two-dimensional space. Let's say we have the vector 1, 1. We have the vector 2, 3, and we have the vector 4, 6. So I have three vectors defined in terms of two-dimensional space. With vectors in two-dimensional space, we know that we only need two of those vectors to form a basis for all of R2, which means that already we know that V cannot form the basis for the subspace R2. If we're interested specifically in the subspace R2, V cannot form a basis for that subspace. In order to form a basis for R2, we would need to get rid of one of these vectors to simplify the vector set. So for example here, if I look at the three vectors, what I see is that this third vector here is a multiple of the second vector. If I just take the second vector and I multiply it by a scalar of two, I'll get two times two gives me four, and two times three gives me six. So this vector here, the third vector, is really just two times the second vector. So it's not providing me with any new information. It doesn't move in a different direction than the vector 2, 3. So it's redundant. This is a linearly dependent set because this third vector is unnecessary. It's already a linear combination of the first two vectors. It's a linear combination of 0 of the first vector and 2 of the second vector. Similarly, if instead of this third vector, I had the vector 3, 4, I can see that this is simply the sum 
of the first two vectors. 1 plus 2 gives me 3. 1 plus 3 gives me 4. So this is the sum of the first two vectors. So this is a linear combination of 1 of the first vector plus 1 of the second vector. That's why these first two vectors, along with the vector 4, 6, form a linearly dependent set, or why these first two vectors, along with the vector 3, 4, would form a linearly dependent set. And the point is that any linearly dependent set cannot form a basis for the subspace. So if instead of this vector set, we just defined v as the vector 1, 1 and the vector 2, 3, now I can say that these two vectors are linearly independent. They're, of course, both defined in R2, and I have only two of them, so I know that they form a basis for the subspace R2. Now, this is just one example, but how would we actually go about testing to see whether or not a particular vector set forms a basis for a particular subspace? Well, of course, we need to check to make sure that we meet both of these conditions. We need to make sure that the vector set would both span the subspace and be linearly independent. So let's do an example here where we have the vector set. Again, we'll do two dimensions and we'll say that we have the vector set 2, negative 3 and 5, 1. And what we want to know is whether or not this vector set forms a basis for R2, for all of R2. The first thing we want to know is whether or not these two vectors span the subspace. We want to see if we can meet this first condition. So the way that we test that is by setting up a linear combination equation. We want to know if I can multiply the first vector, 2, negative 3, by any scalar, and then add to that the vector 5, 1, multiplied by any scalar, can I get to any vector in two-dimensional space, any vector in R2? And we can represent that any vector, that generic vector in R2, as just x, y. So we set up this linear combination equation, and what we're trying to see is, will we always get a valid solution for c sub 1 and c sub 2, no matter which values we choose for x and y? So of course we can solve this with a matrix. We can put the column vector 2, negative 3 into the first column, and then the vector 5, 1 into the second column. And we want to augment that with x, y. And remember that our columns here are representing c sub 1 and c sub 2. And now we want to put this into reduced row echelon form if we can get it there. So let's start by dividing through the first row by 2, or multiplying through the first row by 1 half. When we do that, we'll get 1 half times 2 is 1, 1 half times 5 is 5 halves, and then 1 half times x is x over 2. Then we want to zero out the rest of the first column. We want to get a zero here where the negative 3 is in the 2, 1 position. In order to do that, we'll add 3 of the first row to the second row because when we do that, we'll get 3 times 1 is 3. We can add that 3 to this negative 3 and get 0. So we'll say 3 times 1 is 3, plus a negative 3 is 0. 3 times 5 halves is 15 halves, plus 1 is 17 halves. And then 3 times x over 2 is 3x over 2, plus y is y plus 3x over 2. And so our matrix looks like this. Now we want to multiply through the second row by 2 over 17 to get a 1 in this pivot position. So when we do that, the first row will stay the same, 1, 5 halves, and then x over 2. When we multiply through the second row by 2 over 17, we'll get 0, 1, and then 2 over 17 times y plus 3 over 17 times x. And then the last thing we want to do is zero out this 5 halves right here, which we can do by subtracting 5 halves times the second row from this first row. So in that case, the second row will stay the same, 0, 1, and then 2 over 17y plus 3 over 17x. And then in the first row, we get 5 halves times 0 is 0, 1 minus 0 is still 1. 
and then 5 halves times 1 is 5 halves. 5 halves minus 5 halves is 0. That's what we wanted. And then when we multiply this value here, 2 17ths y plus 3 17ths x times 5 halves, here's what we get. We'll get 5 halves times 2 over 17 times y plus 5 halves times 3 over 17 times x. That's going to simplify here. We'll get the 2's to cancel. We'll get 5 over 17 y plus 15 over 34 times x. Then we want to subtract this value from x over 2. So when I take 1 half x or x over 2 and I subtract this whole value here, I want to multiply the 1 half by 17 over 17 because I'm looking for a common denominator. So I'm going to get 17 over 34 times x minus 5 over 17 times y minus, because I distribute this negative sign to the second term as well, minus 15 over 34 times x. And so when I subtract 15 over 34 from 17 over 34, I'm going to get 2 over 34 or 1 over 17. So I'm going to end up with a result of 1 over 17 x minus 5 over 17 y. And so in my matrix, I'll end up with 1 over 17 x minus 5 over 17 y. So my result then, remember that this column represents c sub 1 and this column represents c sub 2. So when I expand this back out, I get c sub 1 is equal to 1 over 17 times x minus 5 over 17 times y. And I'm going to get c sub 2 is equal to 2 over 17 times y plus 3 over 17 times x. And here's the key point that we want to make. We're trying to figure out if we can use a combination of these two vectors to get to any vector x, y in R2. And we can see that we can when we look at this system of equations for c sub 1 and c sub 2. Because if I pick any value for x and y, let's say I want to get to the vector 10, 6, where x is 10, y is 6, and I want to know what linear combination of these two vectors do I have to use? Well, I simply plug in 10 for x and 6 for y, and this system is going to tell me which values I have to use for c sub 1 and c sub 2 in order for this linear combination here to get me to the vector 10, 6. If I pick a vector negative 7, 4, I simply plug negative 7 in for x and 4 for y, and I'm going to get the values of c sub 1 and c sub 2 that I have to use in this equation for this linear combination to get me to negative 7, 4. So there's no vector that I can choose in R2, no vector I can find in R2 that I can't get to using a linear combination of these two vectors because there's nowhere where these two equations here are undefined for some value of x or y. There's no value you could pick for x, no value you could pick for y that would somehow make the value of c sub 1 or c sub 2 undefined. You can choose any values and I'm going to get a valid result for c sub 1 and c sub 2. So what that tells us is that these two vectors, 2 negative 3 and 5 negative 1, they span the subspace. They span all of R2 because there's no x, y vector we can reach in R2 that we can't get to with these two vectors, with a linear combination of these two vectors. So then the only question that remains is, are these two vectors linearly independent? Remember that in order for the two vectors to be linearly independent, we set up this same equation here, c sub 1 times the vector 2, negative 3, plus c sub 2 times the vector 5, 1. But over here on the right-hand side, instead of this value, I put in the vector 0, 0. And we solve this, and what we're looking for is the values of c sub 1 and c sub 2. If the only possible values I can get for c sub 1 and c sub 2 that satisfy this equation are 0 and 0, then I know that the vectors are linearly independent. If I can find some other non-zero solution for c sub 1 and c sub 2, then I know that the vectors are linearly dependent. But notice here, all we've done is we've replaced the vector x, y with the vector 0, 0. So all I need to do down here in the system I've already found is plug in 0 and 0 for x and y. When I do that here for c sub 1, 
I plug in 0 for x, this term goes to 0. I plug in 0 for y, this term goes to 0. I'm left with c sub 1 equals 0. Down here in the second equation, when I plug in 0 for y, this term goes to 0. When I plug in 0 for x, this term goes to 0. And I'm left simply with c sub 2 equals 0. So when I have x and y both equal to 0, when I use the 0 vector here in this equation, the only possible values of c sub 1 and c sub 2 are 0 and 0. And that conclusion tells me that these two vectors I started with have to be linearly independent. And therefore, because I've shown that these two vectors span the subspace R2, and because I've shown that they are linearly independent, then I know that these two vectors can form a basis for R2. So that's how you figure out whether or not a particular vector set forms a basis for a particular space. But of course, the other thing that we really need to understand here is that going back to this point here, any two, I can pick any two, I picked these two here. We've already looked at the standard basis with the vectors i, 1, 0, and j, 0, 1. These are the standard basis vectors. This is a different set of vectors. But the point is, whether I use the standard basis or a different basis, as long as I have any two linearly independent vectors that are in R2, they can form a basis for R2. I don't just have to use the standard basis vectors. I can use any two vectors. Any two vectors can form a basis for R2 as long as they are linearly independent and in R2. And of course, the same thing is true for R3. I don't just have to use the three-dimensional vectors 1, 0, 0 for i, 0, 1, 0 for j, and 0, 0, 1 for k, the standard basis vectors in R3. I can use any three linearly independent vectors that are defined in R3 to form a basis for the subspace R3.